Growing up, whenever I would hear about the problems with the Marcos administration, one of the most common complaints was that there was a lot of media censorship and propaganda. But just exactly how bad was it and what else can we learn from reading about it in the Conjugal Dictatorship, especially in Chapter 12, which is called the Era of Thought Control? One of the things that I didn't realize before going into the Conjugal Dictatorship was just how much of a focus it would have on media censorship itself or about the news industry and how much Marcus was trying to suppress it. I guess I should have learned or should have known because the author of the book was part of that industry. He's part of the news industry, the media industry. He was what he, what he described as the chief propagandist of Marcos. He described himself as the Goebbels to Marcus's Hitler, which I think is a bit of an exaggeration, but I guess he just means to say that he had a big hand in shaping the public perception of Marcos through his writing in the Daily Express, because there was this paper called the Daily Express uh, where he ended up working, uh, Primitiva Mihares, and uh, he would write a daily column about Marcos called, I think, FM Views, and so, uh, or PM Views, and so he would kind of meet with Marcos almost every day. He'd have lunch with Marcos, and Marcos would tell him what to write for the daily kind of paper. And because of this, he learned a lot about how Marcos wanted to be perceived, how Marcos wanted the world to think about them, how he wanted the Philippines to think about them. And he also learned a lot about the behind the scenes things going on, uh, a lot of the lies and deceptions of the administration and the corruption as well. But because of his position as this journalist who turned into a propagandist, most of the book is from the perspective of the media versus Marcos or Marcos versus the Lopezes, which I've talked about multiple times in these last few videos. And because of this, I'm a bit disappointed that I'm not able to learn more about the other aspects of martial law. Say, for example, the economic aspects of martial law or how like the relationship between Marcos and his other political rivals or not necessarily political rivals, but say even like the NPA or the communist movements, just exactly what was the relationship between them or what was going on with Mindanao or in the various successionist movements with the MNLF and MILF or you know, I, there are many questions I had about just how the daily life was during the Marcos administration, how the average person lives in a way that may have, may have been different from what uh, is, was being said about them. Um, but a lot, of this, uh, a lot of this stuff is, not, is really, not really covered in the book, where it's mostly about really just Marcos versus the media establishment. And that, that's fine. Um, so um, I might as well talk about what I learned from this chapter. Uh, I guess one of the things you want to know, or what I wanted to know when reading about the propaganda machine behind Marcos, is well, exactly how bad was it, or like how, you know, intense was this media censorship? Especially because over the past year, I've been reading a lot about different countries and the histories of different countries. For example, the histories of communism in different countries, where uh, media censorship, as it's called, is pretty much the norm. Where because of a single party state, and many countries that end up having a single party state with a dictator whether it's fascist or communist or uh, whatever, single, just single party uh, parliamentary states or whatever it is, there's a lot of focus on suppressing dissenting views. There's a lot of focus on really making sure that no opposition can really mount power over time. And I wanted to know, like, well, how different was Marcos? And was it, was it any worse or better than what else I've been reading over the past year? Um, what happened was that uh, so in 1971, Marcos, after the bombing at Plaza Miranda, Marcos suspends the writ of habeas corpus. This means that the uh, before you'd have when you get arrested, there has to be like a specific kind of reason, or you need to have like a warrant or something, or something like that. But when you suspend the writ, it means anyone can get taken, you know, for for questioning or whatever, or get imprisoned uh, before you really have like a specific hard case about it. And the reason why it was suspended was it was theoretically to you know find the members, the, I guess, reduced like the bureaucracy maybe of like trying to catch the supposed terrorists or whatever during the time. Uh, so in 1972, uh, in September 23, Marcos announced to the public that martial law was in action, but then he actually signed it into law on September 21. And I think on the night of the 22nd, a lot of these, uh, I forgot if it was part, I think it was part of the way that he signed martial law, but it included lots of closing down of a lot of radio stations things even like uh there was like a there's like a fight in the i like inc english and increase had a station i think where there were a couple of, there was like back and forth some people were killed there um different radio stations and different people who were part of the media industry who were at the time were expressing a lot of dissenting views about marcos because again at the time marcos was really you know trying to position himself in order to stay longer in power 
And around the same time, many newspapers, maybe in radio stations, were already talking about how, you know, trying to warn people about how Marcos was about to do things that will maintain his power. And so for Marcos, these were oppositions. These were people who were expressing views that undermined his legitimacy and his power. And he used his opportunity to, when he announced martial law to arrest all the people who were pretty much advocating these oppositional positions. Uh, not everyone, you know, not everyone necessarily had these positions or were as vocal as Marcos made it out to be, but he really wanted to cover his bases. So many, many people were arrested and almost all of them are from the media establishment. So according to the book's numbers, uh, around 100, almost 100 papers were shut down and almost 300 radio stations. And so it was all over the country where suddenly there was like a, maybe like a media blackout or something where... I guess if, I imagine if you were the average person, you probably would not suddenly have no more communication with, uh, you'd have no more interaction or communication with, I guess, these media systems and you won't know what's going on. Uh, the reason why Marcus said he was doing that, his like in public reason was that he wanted to control the con the spread of conspiracies against the government and that the, the, the idea was that there are many of these people that he was arresting were trying to overthrow the government, and so and because of these various, um, you know, terrorist-like, you know, conspiracy-like ways of thinking, and so he needed to assert order in the country by shutting down the media establishment so he can kind of rebuild it in the future. And a few months later, over time, certain newspapers and uh, I guess radio stations and TV channels were allowed to have be broadcast and allowed to uh, be sold. But at this point, a lot of these newspapers, radio stations, were all owned by Marcos cronies or people who were very closely al allied with the Marcos administration. So, you know, from the outside, Marcos was, was trying to present this story that, well, I just needed to fix, I needed to fix and minimize all of these, like, conspiratorial voices so that I can properly have a true, safe, and orderly country. And, but over time, he said, no, I, f I figure I fixed it now. So now, the media can come back but in reality the media that came back were all owned by his friends and so for example there was a there's like a paper called the times journal owned by coca Ramualdez, who's the brother of emil de marcos and i talked about him in the last video he's part of the you know the unholy trinity of the most corrupt people in the administration and then there were the daily express tv channel 9 uh which are owned by roberto s benedicto and he owned many other radio stations as well and they started. They kind of had all these like different departments that were done, that were made, that were specifically about media censorship. There's one called the Department of uh, Public Information, head by this guy named Francisco Tatad. And you know, there's also a lot of conflict within the administration because a lot of industries, when Marcos established martial law, were given kind of jurisdiction towards by were given the military was given jurisdiction uh, over many uh, industries of the government. And it seems like, so, you know, media was part of that as well, but there was also this thing called the Department of Public Information. And so there's a lot of like conflict amongst themselves about who actually gets the final say in, you know, censoring the media, allowing what is, you know, should be said or what should be spread around. There's even an interesting story in the, in the book, for example, about how there's a film, there's a public premiere of the film called The Godfather by Francis Ford Coppola, one of the, you know, heralded greatest films of all time. And this was in 1972 or 73, I think, where there was supposed to be a public screening of it. And the funds of that would come from the premiere screening were supposed to be redirected to some government agency for something. I forgot, I forgot which one. And uh, when Enrile found out about it, he wanted to have the, the, sh the screening shut down. Or he, he said he wanted to see the film first because he said, the mo for those who haven't seen The Godfather, it's a movie about mafia and the ma like various mafia lords and stuff. And... There's a lot of violence in it. So, and really said, the violence and the, I guess, the immorality of the film does not really cohere with the ideals of the new society of Marcos. And so he wanted to really see the film properly and have the final say. Uh, but there was a lot of, like, again, conflicting power struggles within the Marcos administration. So Tatad wanting to minimize the amount of power the military has over the media and over cinema and film in general, uh, had you know talked to different people and eventually got their the void the word got to Imelda Marcos uh, that Enrile was trying to shut down the screening of this film and Imelda Marcos was really um, big on you know the arts and everything and so uh, they they kind of got Imelda Marcos to talk to Ferdinand uh, to talk to Enrile and finally after all this came out the film eventually premiered and Enrile lost his job as being able to censor the media 
So there are all these stories like this throughout the chapter where, uh, you know, a apart from just not having much information or access to information that was objective or whatever, within the administration, there was a lot of conflict amongst the military and these other people, other cronies, other friends of Marcos, other allies of Marcos, because the military wanted control over things. Some of them wanted to minimize military control and Marcos was kind of in the middle and just, you know, it, it was a weird situation as, as it's presented in the book. One of the interesting things is that, you know, if, if so much of the media, if almost 100% of the media that was very legally uh, distributed and publicly accessible was pro-Marcos, uh, was pro the dictator, or, you know, yeah, pro, yeah, pro Marcos, what, um, where do you get any information that isn't pro Marcos? Can you get any? It seems like there were a lot of underground publications that I guess that were illegal and where they would, they had some circulation and the book kind of mentions a couple of different names of their publications that would, I guess maybe, I, I wish I had access to this so, so them so I could read them as well, but uh, there were a couple of underground publications where anti Marcos sentiment was being spread but more prominently, anti marco sentiment was most developed, apparently, according to the book, and according to some other things I've been reading around it as well, with uh, anti marcos papers in the U.S., in the US, United States. So in, in the United States, there have been many Filipino people over there and many people immigrants. And so uh, many of them, have, some of them have had started these newspapers that were very anti marcos in sentiment in order to convince and to rally the Filipinos abroad who really come together and protest against the United States government for continuing to support the Marcos administration. There is no media freedom in the Philippines, but at least they can find it in the United States. And so in the, in the US, there were, there were a couple of these groups. Um, one of them um, led by Raul Manglapus, who eventually you know, escaped there. Um, but, you know, it, I, think it was second, I think he was a senator and then he got, he was an oppositional senator and I think he may have gotten jailed and he went to the US after and he started this kind of movement of sorts. I don't quite know exactly the extent of how powerful or how successful or how you know relevant it is to learn about the United States uh, anti marcos movements, but I want to look into it because I've seen it referenced in a couple of different places, and so maybe it had more influence to it had a more of an influence um, with regards to how the country was run than you know we would like to admit because I, I definitely did not know anything about this before reading this book and reading around the Marcos administration during this time. And so, yeah, um, after the media was really kind of returned of sorts with all the cronies owning it, there were, owned by, were only a few people. The names given in the book um, are Roberto S. Benedicto, Gilberto Duavit, Coque Romualdez, and there are a couple of these in the Tuveras family. But there are many others as well, where all of them were Marcos cronies. So it brings us back to the question I was thinking earlier, like how bad exactly was this compared to other countries? To be honest, again, it's hard to really say because... Again, in many dictatorships or many single party states, in many, in many um, communist countries, there is extreme media censorship. And there is a lot of like these kind of putting people in jail who are oppositional leaders even. So it's hard to really compare them, but it does feel similar to a lot of what was going on in different dictatorial governments around the world. And I think what is what differentiates Marcus maybe from those other countries is that because we had such a strong reliance in the United States, Marcos was constantly, and even Marcos was a lawyer himself, he was constantly like obsessed with finding legal legitimacy to what he was doing. And he was very concerned about his image. Uh, one interesting story, for example, is that he would do stuff like he would, um, he, there's like problems in Mindanao, right? One of the uh, terrorist leaders or something in Mindanao, he would meet up with them, get send them to Wata, Malacanang, take a picture with him in the golf course near some trees and pretend he went to Mindanao to kind of, you know, broker peace deals or something while uh, he was treating out these, like, I don't know, there are so many weird stories in the book where he, he would kind of have these public forums where he would make it seem like the people were wanted the media to be shut down or he would have these, like, polls and stuff being done. He would have lots of these media events to show that, you know, that he would con continuously deny that there was any kind of censorship going on in the Philippines, although... Many newspapers from around the world um, who were investigating the Philippines would say that you know they would talk about all the media censorship, but he would consistently deny it. He would pretend. So I guess the difference between Marcos and other dictators or other communist leaders or whatever is that he seemed to really, really want to have this kind of acceptance in, in the international community that there is no censorship. But in reality, based on everything I've been reading, it there was a complete censorship and everything was 
very, very heavily controlled by the government and Marcos himself.